Willow. This is Ruin Willow, and you are listening to the Oh Fuck Yeah with Ruin Willow podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I am excited you're here. I'm excited to share this guest with you. Her name is Dirty Lola. She's amazing. You need to hear this interview. It is so amazing. On my podcast, I talk about sex positive things, anything and everything to do with sex and erotica, interviews of experts and erotica authors. And so if you are under 18, it is time to leave the podcast now. This is not for you, baby love. Okay, for those of us who are 18 and over, we are going to hear our amazing discussion that Lola and I had. Who is Dirty Lola? Dirty Lola is a sex edutainer, speaker, and self-proclaimed dildo slinger, known for her live sex ed Q&A show, Sex Ed A Go-Go, and as a co-host of New York Magazine's The Cuts Sex Probs web series, Lola has spent almost a decade working to end stigma and shame surrounding sex and sexuality. Having started her journey sharing personal discoveries with polyamory and kink online, Lola now uses her knowledge, warm candor, and public platforms to teach the masses in person and to wrapped internet audiences. In addition to her educational projects, Lola is also the creative director of Spectrum Journal, an online magazine offshoot of the female-owned online sex shop Spectrum Boutique, based in Detroit, and she has brought her unique brand of sex-positive sex education to brands such as B-Vibe, Spencer's Gifts, and Math Magazine. She also has participated in a Netflix series that is available on Netflix. So stay tuned to learn more about that. And are you ready? Oh, fuck yeah. Let's do it. Oh, fuck yeah. Okay, everyone. I am super fucking pumped to talk to this person. I am so excited. I found her on Twitter. And I was like, oh, damn, I want this person on my podcast. (laughs) This is Dirty Lola. And I'm going to let her introduce herself because she knows herself best. Welcome, Dirty Lola. I'm so excited to chat with you. Hi, thank you. Excited to chat with you as well. And hi, everyone. So I'm, my name is Dirty Lola. I'm a sex educator, a sex expert, sex edutainer based in Brooklyn, New York. And I've been doing sex ed in some capacity for almost a decade. Um, This work encompasses many things. One of those recently uh, was as a sex expert on the Netflix docuseries, The Principles of Pleasure. Uh, But before that, I know I was very excited about being included in that. And before that, I've been teaching workshops. I work in a sex shop in Brooklyn. Um, I'm also creative director of an online sex positive magazine, and I host a show called Sex at a Go-Go that pre-pandemic we did once a month, and I haven't brought back yet because the world's been topsy-turvy, but that's a little bit about me. No, that's awesome. And I saw that Netflix thing, but I didn't realize you were actually on it. That is awesome. Oh, yeah. How, How fun was that? Was that amazing? It was, you know, it was so weird because we filmed it during 2020. So okay. towards the tail end of 2020. So there wasn't, it, it was just me, you know, like I was there with a crew and it was a small crew and we had to, you know, all the COVID precautions and things, but I didn't see anybody else. I didn't know who else was going to be in mm. it fully because right. they were, it was hard to nail people down because it's pandemic. So it's like trying to find people willing to go into a studio to record and be around other people um, Mm -hmm. during that time and, and people's schedules and all the things. So it was wonderful, but I had no idea what it was going to turn out to be. And there was a, a window of time where I was just worried because we didn't get any word from them that it was getting released, released until like a month before. So I I think 
between when I recorded it and when it was actually released, I got maybe two emails that were like, we're, we're editing it. <laughs> and then like, oh, how do you want to be, what do you want your name card to say? <laughs> and right. I'm like, okay, so they're still doing it. They're still doing <laughs> it. Um, so I got to be just as surprised as everyone else when it started. And I'm like, the first thing you see is my face, which was, oh, I wow. screamed. <laughs> I screamed <laughs> because I, I had no idea. And, um, (laughs) but also, you know, you worry when you do these things, as much as you talk to people, sometimes when you do production, I don't know if you've ever done anything with film production or TV or anything, you never know what they're going to make it look like. So, you know, what part you did and you don't know what it's going to turn out to be. And you just hope it's going to be good. And it's not going to be something awful that everyone hates. And I remember just crying out of relief, but just because it was so beautiful and well done and well put together and it was everything I hoped it would be and there's room for improvement you know like I'm like I'm always going to say there's when there is room for improvement but it is just more than I think any of us have gotten in a very long time you know when it comes to talking about bodies and sex that's fantastic and I I am I actually haven't watched it it is live though right I mean it's not like you it's still live it's yeah yeah it's still up it's still up yeah It's three episodes and each episode is an hour. So like you can either binge it or divide it up, but each episode is it's mind, body and relationships. So it's broken up into different pieces. That is awesome. What an amazing thing to be with, but I can see how you would be so nervous because yeah, that the pandemic just really kind of fucked everything up. You know, it's like, nobody knows what's going on and I would be worried too, but at least it happened. Yeah. Yeah. It it happened and it's really lovely. And I'm on, I get to be on Netflix, which is (laughs) still mind blowing. It's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. (laughs) Well, congratulations. How exciting. Not many people can say I'm on Netflix. (laughs) I know it's yeah, definitely a bright, shiny spot on my CV now. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You got to promote the crap out of that for sure. (laughs) <laughs> that's awesome. And, and all your, all your experience, that's just amazing. I, I just started my podcast a little over a year ago, so I'm still pretty new, but I am having a blast. And so when you say sex educator to you, what does that mean? Hmm. Well, for me, my focus is bringing conversations about folks' bodies, relationships, sexuality, gender, all those things, bringing it to adults who didn't really get it anywhere and trying to make it digestible and entertaining because I've always gravitated towards anything that was a learning tool that was also fun. So like, remember Schoolhouse Rock? Mm -hmm. I loved that show when I was a kid and I remember all the things from the songs and it's like oh that's how (laughs) you learn mnemonic devices and all those different things so that's what I wanted to be because I realized there's so many people out there that don't know where to go Mm -hmm. are embarrassed to go to talk to anybody don't really have friends who are also have friends who don't know anything or don't know which of their friends might know some stuff and they're feeling embarrassed about talking to their friends are embarrassed to go into like a sex shop. Don't know, just don't know who to reach out to. And when you make something like the show I was doing sex at a go-go, it's a sex ed Q and a and, and go-go review. And we do it in the backs of bars. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I mean, I've done it in a bunch of different places, but it started, it, started in a bar in the back room of a bar and so it's a place where people come and they're like I'm going to be entertained and this is going to be fun and people are going to talk about sets ha 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 but they also get to anonymously ask questions Mm, so I've gotten so many questions that range from being so funny and you know people are just playing around but there it's like a real question or they think they're being funny but I'm like I can actually answer this question right right and (laughs) like right into some really serious heavy things where it's like, you've never had anybody to ask this. And you've, this was this moment you didn't know you were going to get right. Let let's take care of this. So, you know, that's how I try to move through my work. Um, I think everybody doing work with kids is our rock stars. That is hard. It is Mm -hmm. so hard to do sex ed because of the way schools treat it, the way parents treat it. Like 
the way the world looks at it. Um, and folks think that when you talk about sex ed, that we're like teaching people how to have sex. And while that is a part of it for adults, when you're mm-hmm. like what I do, we're talking, some of it is talking about like sex toys and, you know, how to do things in the bedroom. But most of sex education is learning about your whole body. Yep. Not just reproduction, but also pleasure. And not meaning like, oh, this is how you get pleasure from someone else. It's like your pleasure centers and how you take care of yourself and what pleasure can do for you and your brain and how it helps you live a fuller life. And it's also about identity and gender and sexuality and all of those things that kind of get pushed aside and don't get really put into the spotlight when people talk about sex ed, everybody just goes straight for like, oh, you're, you're teaching kids about sex. And it's like, oh, yes and no. We're right. teaching them about like their bodies and how their bodies work and not just how to make babies yep. and about all these other bits and pieces that like none of our parents talk to us about our, you know, our gender identities. None of our parents talk to us about our sexuality. Um, at least, you know, I don't know how old you are. I'm 40. So that my generation, my, I'm a zennial and we didn't get that. Um, right. So, and I think the, the younger generation is you're seeing it more. But Mm -hmm. I don't think it's, I still don't think it's their parents as a whole. I think it's that society has become a place where these things are out there. So kids know they have choice. They know that there isn't a binary. They don't have to fit in a box. They can explore things. Yeah, it's definitely more commonplace. Yes, absolutely. Just more more accepted. Not that it's fully accepted by any means, but it's just more. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I love that entire explanation and I 100% agree with you. <laughs> so <laughs> true. And it's so needed because, yeah, like you said, there's a lot of things that haven't been talked about that people are curious about. And, you know, it's, it, you can read about it and stuff like that. But asking your question is also so important in, you know, just, uh, you know, it's so individual and it's important to address an individual's question rather than them listening to just like a talk about. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very valuable. Absolutely. So, and when you do that, when you, when you do your podcast or when you did the podcast, did people like come on live or like, were they seen or were they kind of like, you know, not shown and in the background or was it something you just read anonymous and then answered questions or was kind of a combo? Oh, so it was a live stage show. So it wasn't That's what even, I thought I, it was live. Yeah. yeah, it was a stage, a live stage show, but that we would record it and then put the recording up as a podcast, but the gotcha show itself was live so folks would we made it fun so there was a break in the middle like we'd start the show it would be myself a special guest the special guest was always somebody who was somehow involved with the sex ed sexuality field I mean Mm -hmm. we had everybody from a comedian with sex centered you know material to porn stars to other educators yeah the the gamut um Mm -hmm. and then we had the performer and the performer also answered the question. So we were, I called them my pussy posse. So they were my posse. We answered Mm -hmm. questions. And then there was a break in the middle where after we did the introductions and we would do usually do like a couple warm up questions, just so people would kind of get a feel for what we do. Mm -hmm. Uh, The performer would do their bit, they do their thing. And while they were doing it, I'd walk around and there were little slips of paper and I'd tell people, I'm going to come pick up your questions. I'm also going to sell raffle tickets. And I did that so that stopping at a table didn't have to feel like, oh, those people uh, asked a question. It yeah. could be that they were buying a raffle ticket or, sure. you know, something. So I'd go around and we made it fun and I'd pick up the questions and stuff them in my bra. You know, it's like keeping it lively and um, folks would just fold them in half and like fold them in half and give them to me. I don't, you know, need to see what it is before I get on stage. And we did that. And so folks would do that for the most part people loved that there were always some someone who would raise their hand <laughs> and want to <laughs> ask their question out loud which was you know uh, fine yeah, um, yeah but it it gave people a moment to be able to you know not have to feel judged not sometimes people would claim their question they go that was me and you know but other times they wouldn't <laughs> and yeah. um so it was it was just a an opportunity for people to be there and be present, but not have to feel like the focus was on them right. when we were answering questions. Yeah. 
Sounds like an ideal environment. Now, the Sex at a Go-Go podcast, people can still watch that, right? It's it's still somewhere that people could watch? Yes. You could well, you can listen to it. It's on um it's on iTunes, the the okay. Apple podcast. You can listen to it there. I think it's on Stitcher still. Um, I know all the episodes that we did put up. We stopped recording it at like in 2018. So even mm-hmm. though we were still doing the show, we stopped recording it. Mostly that just because it got taxing for me to <laughs> do all the things. But sure, sure. Um, yeah, it's still there. There's 39 episodes. Um, nice. Some of them are hard to listen to because it isn't a bar. So it's oh, like, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, some of them is like, <laughs> you it's the audio is great and sometimes it's people laughing I mean it sounds like a good time but yeah. <laughs> if you're trying to hear it, I always warn people like just just be ready for it to be raucous at point at point <laughs> exactly and you're not going to be in a bar or a group of people without having that happen <laughs> right exactly <laughs> it'd be kind of eerie if it was <laughs> right it'd be like you're in school or something you know like there is one episode that is really quiet and that's because it was whatever happened, the perfect storm, nobody showed up. Oh, and that happens. Uh-huh, it, yeah. it, and it happened. My first show, I had one person, this particular show, it was just the perfect storm of people who had bought tickets were like, Oh, I can't make it, you know, donate my ticket. Like it's fine. Mm. And nobody showed up. And the, my special guest showed up and then the performer showed up and both of them were like, we don't mind if you want to still record. And he, and yeah. the, my guest was just like, listen, this is my social anxiety was off the charts today. So this is kind of the oh. best situation. So we <laughs> ordered pizza nice. and we sat in the back room and we recorded a show and then two people showed up late and they came <laughs> in and they were two students who had forgotten their IDs and had to oh. go all the way back. So oh, that's geez. why they were late, but ah. it was great. I gave them, I gave, I was like, it's okay. You can sit and listen to the rest of the show and you're the only two people you win the raffle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it was a great show. You know, we made the best out of a, you know, which could be looked at as a not great situation, but I think we were all like in a mood. It was raining. It was just a day. Uh, we were like, this is cozy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and the, the beautiful thing is you, you recorded it. So then people can continue to listen to it. So it's never a waste. Right. It's, it's out there, you know? It's out there. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, that sounds like a blast. Sounds like you guys had a lot of fun. Do you think you'll ever go back to doing it? Oh, definitely. Um, it's just been hard. Like with here in New York, at first it was, I felt really irresponsible bringing it back to an indoor mm. vid- venue and then things yeah. got better. So I started looking and then things got worse. We've been going back and forth, but I finally found a venue that is outdoors and I would be able to bring it back for a couple shows late summer, early fall when the weather's still nice. So I am excited to be able to do that. And I'm also bringing it back. Um, I was invited to bring the show to Bali to a couple's retreat. So I will be taking it in other places. Yeah. So it's going to come back, but at least I'll have one New York show that I'm plotting on if I'll be, my plan is to try to like record it or, or do it live via zoom, like do it live, but then also set up the laptop so people can watch it. Oh, um, sure. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to figure that out. I have a friend I need to call like help. How do I do this <laughs> the most efficient way? Exactly. Exactly. All that technical stuff. If you're going to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So I noticed that uh, one of your titles is a dildo slinger. I love that. I'm a total lover of sex toys. So I'm excited to talk to you about sex toys. Let's do it. (laughs) Let's do it. (laughs) So do you have, what would would you say if I like gave you no prompt? What would be the first thing you would say about sex toys? Oh my gosh. I guess that is a prompt, isn't it? (laughs) Right. That is a prompt. Um, They're infinite. There's. Yes so many so so many like if you walk into a large the largest store that you could find that sells sex toys somewhere in this country there's still like probably 20 or 30 more of those stores more more full to like there's just there's so many companies that make sex toys who have a large catalog um a lot of things that look the same but also just so many different tweaks there's yeah I go to trade shows I have a trade show coming up in 
July um, oh. that I'm excited about because I haven't been to a trade show since before everything exploded. Um, right. And it's so, even for me, it's overwhelming because there's so oh, much, yeah. <laughs> there's so much and, um, but it's amazing and fascinating that that much pleasure, you know, is being, or the vehicles for pleasure is being produced. And yet we still live in a place where it's yeah. so poo-pooed, you know, at the end of the day, as much as, as much as we have, you know, shows on Netflix and, and erotica and porn and all the things, we still kind of live in a place where a lot of people have to seek that out in, in the shadows, you know, they can't yeah. really be open about it. Um, very or, odd, isn't it? It's very odd. And that the people who sell it, like depending on the state you're in, it's very hard to like have a welcoming, lovely store because your town might demand that you black out your windows. So you're not going to have sunlight. Right. Um, right. You, you <laughs> might have to be in a more desolate area. So, so you're not even like in within town limits. You might be like along the highway and all those notes that make them not feel fun or safe for everyone. Yes. Um, sometimes isn't even the choice of the people who own the, the places. It's like what yeah. they have to do in order to be able to exist. So it's so, it's so funny. <laughs> It's so how much odd. Is out there. Yeah. All these companies making these products and yet it's still considered taboo. It's just, to me, it's very, very bizarre. And yeah. And, and look how many more, I mean, they are just sex toy companies are popping up all over the world. And here we all are over. in our country still like, Oh, that's taboo. We better black out the windows. Someone might see it. Yeah. You know, it's like so weird. I just, I, it's so incongruent. I just don't get it. I mean, I know it's our, our sex negative culture, but it's just. I know. And our, and you know, it's a very large industry. Sex toys, yeah. is it 52 billion? I forget how much money. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot of money that uh, projected yeah. to be making by like 25, uh, 2025. So yeah. And it's just going to keep growing. We're a very large part of the economy, you know, yes, like big time. during the pandemic, you know, what business did not go under sex shops. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We did it. Probably sex increased, shop, right? It did. Sex shops were reporting record sales. I know yeah. the shop, the brick and mortar I work in our Christmas, our, our 2020 Christmas was three times our best Christmas. So oh, I believe it. Yeah. You know, it's, we are an industry. We, we provide jobs, you know, like yep. we, people have stores and all, even online stores have oh, yeah. workers, warehouses have workers. Like we provide jobs for people. We, mm -hmm. um, the money that gets put into, you know, shipping and receiving and all the things, just manufacturing, all of that stuff is jobs that kind of get looked down upon. And the funny mm -hmm. thing is, is that a lot of sex toy businesses, especially the old stall rewards, the ones who've been around, they're mm -hmm. family owned. They're <laughs> right. <laughs> they're literally, and I don't mean like the dad started it and nobody else knows about it. Right, I mean, right, right. they're family owned. Everybody is a part of the business. Like there's a cock cage company that was like the first cock cage company. And mm -hmm. it was a husband and wife and they had kids and their kids went and left their parents' business and opened up their own cockade. Like they're continuing <laughs> the wow. generations and now they're bringing their kids into the business. So it's a family run and owned business. It's a, it's a lot, it has a lot of Americana. If you really put it, dig it down, it was a lot of people finding a thing that made money yeah. and investing in it and building it up. Like, you it's know, a business. it's a business. It's, yeah. It's not a taboo thing. It's, just, it's a legit business. It's a legit way to make money. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, how much pleasure does it bring people? I mean, seriously, that's like, I don't know how satisfying for them. <laughs> to right. Making yeah. All these toys for people to find pleasure with. So do you have a favorite one? Ooh. <laughs> I know that's a hard say, question. <laughs> well, for me, it's a little easy because I, I'm like, as much as I love sex toys, I'm a creature of habit. I will say, mm. if we're going by type, my classic favorite type are wands. Okay, I'm a yep. big fan of like the magic wand, but I've also discovered like the wand makes 
um, like a, it's called feel my power. And okay. I, I'm enjoying that. I have a, I have a few different wands. Wands are like my classic favorite, favorite, but mm. then, which is fairly new still, it's been out a few years, but it's still considered a new kid on the block. All the air pulse air pleasure toys, oh, like yes, the rose yes. and the womanizer satisfying yes. all those. That yes. those are now like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so those oh, are the two yeah. things if I go away on a trip I always have a wand yes. and some kind of air pulse toy with me yeah that's interesting because my first my first sex toy was a wand too I think they're just kind of like um they're not as like scary and they can be used in other ways like for sore muscles so they're not as intimidating and I think it's a great one for people to start with who are right. either timid or scared or just they don't really know what's going on or they're just nervous a, a wand is the perfect first sex toy to buy yeah yeah especially because they make small ones now too like you don't have to get mm-hmm. the big one even magic wand they recently came out with a mini um okay. So like, if you're, cause sometimes people look at the size and I'm like, it doesn't go inside. Right. It's okay. <laughs> I mean, cause they always right. think that and I'm like, no, it's know, just for right. external stimulation. You can use it on a clitoris or a penis, but mm-hmm. if you're worried about that, like they sell mini wands, you know, like that are yep. still not super intimidating and you can like put it in a drawer and not have to worry about it. And if somebody finds it, you can, you can say it, it's, for my muscles. I use mine for my back all the time. <laughs> right. I mean, they're versatile. I mean, why not? They are. <laughs> I think it's too, it's also a great one. Like if, you know, if one partner really wants to do sex toys and the other one doesn't, it's a nice segue into being like, Hey, let's get this. And, you know, and then they can eventually, you know, maybe start it on a, a non-sexual organ and then maybe slowly introduce it to a sexual part of the person's body. And it's just, it will be more accepting. I would, you know, it's just, it's not going to be like this weird, scary looking thing where they're like, holy shit, don't touch me with that thing. You know, it's <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Like, why does it have prongs? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> where does that go? I know. Right? <laughs> yeah. I'm a huge um, lover of sex toys too. And I just, like you said, I love the variety that is out there. And for sure, for me, the, um, yeah, the clit suckers are, are top for me. The other one I really like that I found recently is the Zumio. Ooh. And that one is very, it's very, very, very targeted. So it kind of, it's, it it doesn't even look like a regular sex toy. It looks like a big pen and it's got this little vibrating head at the end. And they have three, I think they're three different styles. And so they're like three different intensities and they're just, there's, if you're someone who likes clitoral stimulation, it is so targeted and strong. It'll blow your mind. I mean, I just. I, you know, gotta look uh, for that. <laughs> yeah. So it's so amazing. And it, it, it totally just looks like a big, thick pen. And then it's like tapered oh at the end where the little head is. It's, it's really mind blowing. I, I, um, <laughs> I saw it. I don't even remember how I saw it. And then I tried it out. And then, so I became a, an affiliate for them to try and help them sell it. I'm like, this toy kicks ass. I mean, it is. Oh, wow. It is good. Now I have not tried the womanizer, but that's just, I, that's next on my list. That's a clit sucker though. Pretty much. Right. From yeah. What I hear. They make, yeah. and they make a bunch of different types at this point. Like they mm. have so many different models. My favorite, my hands down favorite. And I say this having tried so many of those air pulse toys I've tried, mm-hmm. I own like 15 at this point, I think, cause I get them to <laughs> test and stuff. Yeah. I, it, and I say they all work beautifully. They yes. all work beautifully. I haven't met one yet that didn't get me off. Right. Um, yep. And they Same. all have their, their different attributes, but there's mm-hmm. something about the womanizer to go that it looks like a giant lipstick. It's comical. It's not discreet. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I think they were, I, I always say, was this like an April Fool's Wool's joke because did you really right. did you really think that this was gonna look like a lipstick in someone's bag? Because it's huge. It looks yeah. like it's like the size of a cell phone. Like it's actually a little bit bigger than a cell phone lengthwise. Oh, wow. Okay. But they made it look like it has a cover. So you take it off when you take it off, the little head looks like a lipstick. Like it looks like a hot oh. pink lipstick. It's yeah. not no one would think that this was a lipstick in your bag. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so funny, but it's my favorite my favorite Mm. air pulse toy and I don't it's something about the shape of the head the 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 motor it's a perfect storm and so when compared Mm. to the others 
this one wins, but yeah. I always tell folks you you can't go wrong getting one of these toys and right. even the rose. I know people, I'm like the people in our industry are kind of like, oh man, this rose. Cause it's not made by, it's one of those toys that's kind of like a mold was made in a factory in China and mm-hmm. everybody can throw their label on it. Yeah. You yeah. know, like, and, and that's how sex toys for for the most part, a lot of sex toys are made that way. It's kind of like mm-hmm. everybody gets to white label, whatever. Right. So some of them are not the best, but I'm like, listen, if it didn't cost you a lot of money and you liked it, then go right. invest in one that costs a little bit more. Like right. if you love the rose and it broke <laughs> too long, go get a womanizer. Now, you know, you like it. Go, go spend the money on one with like a Primo motor and, you know, heads that swap out because, you know, I love, I love accessibility and making it so that if you get something and you're, it's just a little too small for your clit, you can like pop that head off and pop on a new one. That's a little right. bit bigger. Um, and they've even started making other, like they sell like a box of just the heads so you oh. can swap them out um, of the models that you they already had out. So I'm a big proponent of, I'm not against buying cheap toys as a tryout. Right. Um, I don't, I don't think you have to go break the bank the first time you go. I yeah. want you to buy that $25 bullet to find right. out if you like the bullet or even to find out, do I like that kind of a sensation? And then you can go, Oh, you know what? I really love this, but I want X, Y, Z. Like you're able to kind of extract extrapolate what you want once you've yes. gotten your foot in the door. So buy the cheap thing. Um, the only time I warn against cheap is with dildos um, and buying, making sure it's not jelly only because mm. our sensitive bits and phthalates are not friends and it's not a great idea, but they make like TPE, which is thermoplastic elastomer, scientific over here, but okay. um, it's not silicone. You can't sterilize it, but you mm. can wash it. So it's yep. fine for like one hole or the other. Don't, don't share holes. Don't really share right. it with folks because you can't sterilize it, but. Mm-hmm. You know, there's always a way to get something to try out to see if you like it so you can learn if you love it and then you can go spend a little bit more money when you have it. Oh, absolutely. And I think also using those also, yeah, it teaches you about what you do want. And maybe you want one with more modes. Maybe you want a stronger one. Maybe you don't want a stronger one. And that'll help guide you when you're going to go buy, if you use these other cheaper toys, it'll help guide you when you're going to go, yeah, like you said, spend the, the big bucks on a more quality made toy or with a stronger motor or something. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. the other thing I have to say about that is, you know, if you get one and it's kind of a cheapy one and it's not that strong, well, you know what, that's also a great edger. Use right. that one first and then go on to something else, whether that be with your partner or a stronger toy, it still has value. If it edges you, if it makes you feel anything, it still has value. It still has value. And I'll say, you know, the market is forever updating and changing so even now things that the price points that used to be not great are making sturdier things that you know actually last a little bit longer so it's like get that right. 30 40 dollar thing and that still might last you a while um right. so you know it's down when people go well i want good quality and i'm like here's the thing quality because silicone's a little cheaper the tech is a little cheaper you know things are a little it's made it easier for companies to give you better quality and a lower price option so now luxury Mm -hmm. like luxury (laughs) (laughs) right oops did I lose you oh no I'm here Oh, good. <laughs> it went silent. And I'm like, oh, that was no. cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just love sex toys. And I, I have some fans who follow me that, you know, they'll say I might like, you know, try out a sex toy and then I'll promote it on social media. And I always get these people that say, oh, now it's going to replace all of us or, you know, things like that. Uh, and I'm always like, it's not possible to replace a human being. This is an enhancement. It's, it's a tool. It's a tool. And here's the thing. Yes. If for folks who are single, is it a stand in? Yes. Is it helping someone achieve pleasure that maybe like while they're by themselves that maybe they're not, you know, so they're not feeling like, oh, I can't do this because I don't have a partner. Sure, sure, sure. But sex toys are for 
so single people, couples, whatever, ruffles, everybody. It's a tool yeah. to be utilized for different reasons. And I always make the remark that you can't build a house without a hammer. Yes. So why are you trying to get to an orgasm without using any kind of tool? And I don't mean like, because <laughs> I know there are folks who don't need a vibrator, right? But there's right. lube, there's something mm-hmm. in there that's going to help you get where you need to go. And you're right. It doesn't replace human touch, body heat, kissing, dirty talk, all these things. It doesn't replace that. And if you're worried about being replaced, I think that means you need to look at yourself and see what you're doing. Because if if your game isn't up, are you, you you know, where, where, where are you on the scale of being able to pleasure your partner where you feel like a bullet toy or even a thruster is going to replace you? Because thrusting toys are great. It's not another body pressed against you saying dirty right. things in your ear, lifting right. your hips, you know, digging into your flesh, all those things that make sex hot. Yes, this toy can mimic some sensation, but it can't give you everything. So, you know, look at it as a teammate. I tell people that all the time. It's a teammate. It's a yep. tool for your toolbox in your bedroom. It's a teammate. It's somebody, it's another person without it being a person. Like it's another thing in the room that can help you both get to where you want to go, you know, get to that, that pleasure point. Yeah. I think people's egos get in the way. I mean, look, at look they at do. how many tools we have for making food. Nobody's yeah. Like, you don't need that many tools to make food. I'm like, yes, you do. There's like thousands right. of different things, you know, like it's just pretty much the same thing. <laughs> yeah. But it's also the, like one of the big things that principles of pleasure focuses on is the orgasm gap and that mm-hmm. most folks with vulvas don't, come through penetration they need external stimulation and as much as I wish we you know maybe this is something that we will evolve to do humans don't vibrate so (laughs) no matter how fast you think you can rub your fingers Mm -hmm. sometimes that doesn't work for everyone some people are sensitive and that works for them I've never like even when I was young and wasn't really using sex toys manual ma- manipulation took me forever ever oh, yeah. using yeah. my hands I was a humper like humping yes. took forever so it was this has never been a thing of like oh well it's because you use sex toys it's like I didn't use I didn't buy my first sex toy until I was right 19 20 um so and I was I've been masturbating since I was five or six so I've, right, I've been right. in there and I had a lot of orgasms that didn't involve anything mechanical and it took me a while. So it's just everybody's body is a little different and we need, we need different things. And there's no shame in that. It's just learning what do you need and having a partner willing to like figure out how, how do we make this work? So for me, I'm a big fan of, I like to, I love sex, even if it doesn't involve an orgasm, like I have a partner Mm -hmm. that our sex is amazing. I love the way it feels. And I like being able to concentrate on the pleasure I'm getting without having to concentrate on like, I have a goalpost to get to. And when I stopped doing that, it's made me be able to really enjoy the act of sex. Right. Um, And so the whole body of sex for me is this big warm up. And then after my partner orgasms, he goes, okay, what do you want out of your toy bag? Like, what do you need? You want the (laughs) wand? You want the this? Like, what do you want right now? How do you want me to help? So we'll, he'll like, give me a thing. And he's like, where do you want me on your body? Like, what what am I doing? And it's still, we're still having sex, right? It's not over. I'm just now, we're we're now like into this other part of like, now I'm getting my orgasm. And sometimes I'm so satisfied. I'm like, I just want to take a nap. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. I'm also a fan of, you know, we don't, he's long distance and I don't see him often. So sometimes I like to like not orgasm a few times and all the sex we're having. And I like to like save it up for yeah, yeah. like a bigger moment, but having somebody in your life who's game. Yes. And who's, he's also pushed me to like, think about how I orgasm a little bit differently. And, and I was able to achieve like an internal in- orgasm with mm, him. Um, nice. And, but that really came from not feeling like I can't share this with him. And I can't, if I show him, I like toys, it's going to be a thing. And it was like, he's like, okay, this is great. How are right. we going to do this? Yeah. And it makes I, it hot. <laughs> makes it oh, so yeah. so much better. I mean, yeah, just think how much variety that adds too. And, you know, just all the different sex toys you can try. 
yeah, and just something new to try. Be like, hey, let's try this one. It's just something fun to yeah. do, you know? It, and it takes the pressure off. Because mm-hmm. I, and I talk about this all the time. We do put a lot of pressure on folks with penises. Yeah. Um, cis men, especially. Like, we get a lot of pressure yep. for them to just know. And it's like, we don't even know about our bodies. How will they know? They right. weren't in the room. We all got separate lessons and none of it yep, was about yep. pleasure. No, so, exactly. You know, exactly. I, I look at them when they come in the store and they're being kind of <laughs> with their, you know, partners. I'm like, hey, <laughs> hey, I'm not saying you're not capable, but wouldn't it right. feel good knowing that it's not all on your shoulders? Like yes. this is, uh, this is another way you can help your partner get where you clearly want them to be because you're in the store with them. Right. You clearly want to bring them pleasure. So why not look at this as just a, a helper? another way something and you know they make again we we said this at the beginning they make so many types so there's toys that you that are small so they fit in the palm of your hand so it's easier to hold Mm -hmm. what when you're like in between a partner they they make um you know the cock rings that have vibration on it so it could be a clitoral stimulator they make um toys that like can go inside and still fit outside and then your partner can penetrate you there's so much out there oh yeah Teamwork can make the dream work. You just have to like kind of get over the it needing to just be you. Right. In in yeah. you know, in a way it's kind of silly too. It's like, you know, okay, you can people with penises can use their penis, they can use their hands, they can use their mouth. Why is it so foreign to so many people then to be that they can hold a toy? I mean, it's still them right. controlling it. It's just I have an added enhancement, an added motor, uh something, you know? Yeah. 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 And I remind folks with penises is like your sex organ that, you know, can get stimulated is very visible. Yes, Ours exactly. Is mostly exactly. on the inside. So all the things yep. that can be done to your penis to manipulate it, to, to stimulate it and bring you pleasure to get to ours, we literally do need this vibration. We yes. need, it's science. It's, we need sonic sensation. Like we do need that because all of our most of our clit is inside what's outside is tip of the iceberg literally right so what we need to get to is inside and how do you do that you would think penetration but it doesn't work like that (laughs) and it it, it could be right depending on how it can be clitoris is seated yeah right or the angle or yeah Mm -hmm. yeah yeah but then Mm -hmm. you're you're still bringing in tools right you're bringing in a wedge or a pillow folded in half or straps that bring the legs up you're doing something so even if it's not a vibrator you're still doing other things to get to that point so what it's just another tool it's just another way to get to it exactly and in, in you know the whole ego thing it's like if, if the partner, the penis is still using the tool, they are the ones controlling it. How, right. You know what I mean? Like, it's just kind of an oxymoron, you know? Listen, I, I always, I use the, <laughs> I love bringing it back to like tools, but also barbecuing. And I'm like, when you yeah. barbecue, when you bring that food <laughs> off the grill, nobody says that grill did a great job. Right. You get the credit. You did the credit. You utilize the tools at hand. You utilize that spatula, that fork. You utilize the charcoal and the grill. And nobody goes to you. That grill did a great job. They go, man, you're a great cook. You did a really great job because you you were wielding those tools. Your expertise and knowledge on how to use those tools created something delicious. Yes. Hello, sex toy. <laughs> <laughs> and the other funny thing that just popped in my head is that they're not fucking using their fingers to flip that steak. No. They're using a tool. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? You're like, no, no, no. How dare you use a tool? <laughs> oh man, that cracks this? me up. You're going to flip oh. those burgers with your fingers? <laughs> Do it. <laughs> I want you to get that cheeseburger off. No, no spatula. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. See there, there there again, you're using a tool. Why are tools so bad? They're not. (laughs) And they're essential. They're not. Yeah, (laughs) they are. And if you feel, and I think sometimes there are moments where people feel replaced because maybe their partner is using the toy when they're not at home to masturbate or like I've had people say like, oh, I've had plenty of women who tell, tell me like, 
they masturbate in the bathroom, they hide from their husband and their kids mm, yeah. and they take a bath, quote unquote, air quotes, lock the door. And that's their, their masturbation time. Right. And it's because they feel like they can't share that or they feel like they can't, can't go like this, this feels good to me, or they don't want to hurt their partner's feelings. Right. You know, there are so many people out there still pretending they're orgasming. I know. Because, and oh. it's not about being deceitful. It's because there, there aren't, I will tell you, there are not a lot of cis men who want to hear that and who, right. would, who would not be mean and hurtful and, you know, cruel if they were sat down and told that their partner had been faking because, and, right. and even if it's not like, I'm not blaming you, I'm trying to figure out how to do this. And I, cause I had that conversation. It was in my yeah. early twenties, oh, sure. but I had that conversation with the man who became my husband and now he's my ex-husband but when we first moved in together and we were you know in this I had a decision to make I was like I can keep faking which is going to hinder my exploration of my body and trying to figure out how to orgasm yep when I'm having sex with another person not necessarily in tandem with but like during the act you know at any point because I wasn't and I was Mm -hmm. just pretending um, and I can keep acting like this is all good. And eventually this is going to be a problem and break me down. Yep. Um, and I can keep hiding that I'm orgasming when he's not home or I can tell him. And it was hard. He was really upset. He felt yeah. like crap. It hurt him. And right. I'm like, but it's not about you, honey. Like it's about me and yep. that I've never been able to orgasm with another person. And I would like to learn how to do this with you. Right. And I'd, I'd like to stop hiding my actual pleasure that I'm having because I can't duplicate it when I'm with you yet. And, and to figure out how I can do this with you present um, is a thing. And so, you know, you get over the hump and, and, you know, it gets into it, but it's, it's hard. So anybody out there who's still, I know I'm not saying it's easy, but it becomes a point where you can't, if you are in a relationship, you can't keep trying to find your own pleasure without that other person being involved because otherwise you're just creating a whole separate pleasure world without them. And then eventually that's going to be an issue. Right now where I think it's okay is when both partners know about it and maybe yes. one has a different level of libido than the other. Yes. Yes. So yes, then yes, yes. I, yeah. So then I think that's totally fine. And, you know, right. I've talked to other sexologists and people who say, you know, the more you masturbate, the more sex you have, the higher. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, oh, yes. you know, <laughs> so partners and definitely really- masturbate because yeah. that's your blueprint. That's how you find yes. like still masturbate, but share it, you know, like mm-hmm. take, what Don't you, hide take it. your findings, yeah. right. Take your findings back to your partner. <laughs> and that's, yes. that's what I wanted to do is like, I loved masturbating and I'm like, okay, so I can come when I'm doing this. What is the difference? And I was like, oh, you know, porn helps my brain stay focused on the pleasure. And I sure. don't start thinking about the laundry list or cause it's trauma right. response. I have some trauma things in my background. Mm-hmm. And so trying to stay in my body during sex is hard. Surprise, surprise, porn is quite helpful for that because it's a a pleasure thing happening while you're doing a pleasure thing. So you're surrounded by it. So in order to take that to my partner and explain to him why I needed it, suddenly I had to like come clean about that. So yes, Mm -hmm. please keep masturbating. Please masturbate. I know too many women who don't masturbate and it's, you need to learn what you like so that you can tell people what you like. You I just, I just feel like waiting for your partner to find that place. It's like a, what's right. that game? It's like Marco Polo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like they're blindfolded and they're like, Marco, and you're like, Polo. <laughs> and they're trying to find it. So where, if you can, if you masturbate, you can always come back and go like, oh, so, hey, I love this kind of touch right. or this toy. Oh, let can we try to figure out how we can use this? Cause I think it would be great. Like, Ooh, this wand while we're doing doggy style, like, let's try that. Right. But you wouldn't know that. Right. Unless you tried it out on your own and saw how you, maybe you liked how it worked. And I think it makes it a little less awkward if you buy something new and you give it a go by yourself at first, yep, you know, yep. so you can kind of see how, get the kinks out. How does this work? How do I turn it on? What are all the things I need to know? Right. And Yeah. 
And then you can, you can teach your partner about, Hey, this is what happens with my body. When I use this, term. Right. you're not expecting them to be a mind reader. You know, you, you can assess a person about, you know, the sounds they're making, the moves they're making their response, but right. you still can't, you still can't read another person's mind. So. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's a, it's about communication and, mm-hmm. um, seeking pleasure alone while you figure alone and together it's figuring yeah. yourself out so you can share it um I'm also a big fan of mutual masturbation which I yeah. think is so hot mm-hmm. oh, but yeah. you get to kind of be in control of your orgasm while also experiencing your partner you get to experience each other mm-hmm. I mean watching how each other how you how you each touch yourselves is just right I've learned things watching yes. lovers because I'm like I didn't know you like your ball touched. Right. Not like that. I didn't know you like it to be pinched or you want that to be, you know, a finger there. Or, you know, you pick up stuff and you're like, ooh. <laughs> exactly. You got these I'm, little nuggets of information. I, I'm writing this down. So it's, <laughs> I always tell folks like masturbation is not a bad thing. It's, I think it becomes bad when people feel shut out, right? When people feel like, yeah. Right. happening without them or it's happening instead of like when right. there's masturbation happening but you're not having sex and it's like right. well, why aren't we having those are when the points when I get when people get very frustrated about and that's understandable I mean that's understandable yeah. you know it's you know it's one thing if one person just wants to do more um, the other person is okay with it but if yeah if they're feeling like they're being shut out completely or just not included then that's that's a problem Right. Exactly. And you brought up porn. I think in my mind, porn is also a tool. Yes. Agreed. So so many people get so offended if they find out that their partner watches porn. And again, you know, porn is it's on a level of entertainment and it cannot replace a person. So I just don't really get why people get upset about it. It's just I don't know. I think they feel like they're being compared. Maybe I don't know what it is, but I don't know why well, it has to be so taboo. I do get it. So I get it on a level, a few levels. The truth is they are being compared for the most part. Mm-hmm. I won't say everyone, but sure. the sad thing is porn for a lot of people of our age range up into our age range and older. Um, porn was their sex ed. So it's where they saw yeah, sex right. with women. So it's where mm-hmm. they learned their god awful sex moves. Right. It's where they learned like the jack the jackhammer. Everyone's favorite. Yeah. It's uh-huh. where they learned like how to like oh women like to be treated like this, which some do, right? Like right, I like right. to be a dirty girl. Yes, I like being smacked with a dick every once in a while, but that's right. not how you. That's not how everyone. And the thing about porn to remember. And to know is that it is entertainment. It is yes. literally, it's edited, edited. Right. To edit, why can't I say that? It's edited <laughs> to be, look a certain way. Um, there's a lot of things happening on set to make people last longer, to, you know, jazz up the, you know, ejaculation to make it uh, look a certain way. And, and a lot of porn in the beginning, like female orgasms weren't even happening or it was just a lot of moaning and it wasn't like, it wasn't like a real, like, you know, sexist response. You're seeing it more in things. So, and there's Mm -hmm. a lot of porn that isn't great, right? Like not that it's bad content, but just, it's not, it's kind of, it treats women, especially poorly. So I get Mm -hmm. why people have an issue with it, but to say that there is so much good porn out there that takes accountability into desire and how that works and what people are looking for. So they put it into the story and connection and right bodies and creating fantasy. And there's also, you know, thanks to people like Shine Louise Houston making porn mm-hmm. for folks who aren't of the binary and who are queer and LGBTQ right. and and yeah. there's so much out there. Um, it's hard to sort through. So I think it's a lot of people think when, when they're against porn, it's because they're picturing a very specific kind of porn. Yes. And I, think that I wish people knew that there is a lot more out there uh, and a lot more 
um, ethical porn being made where people are not being treated poorly on set and not being treated poorly after and being paid fairly. Like all the things that might yes. make you feel guilty about watching it. It, it oh, exists absolutely. in a different place. Yeah. But I do and get where people, because we've always shunned porn. Porn has always been like it's the thing dirty old men watch and boots. Right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> Well, and it's so true. There's so much out there. I actually just started writing for Frolic Me, which is a porn site where they, they kind of specialize in making porn for women where there's a story. It's sensual. My story hasn't gone live yet, but you know, it's like people haven't seen that kind of porn. People have seen like the porn you just said, you know, this old stuff that has like an, you know, it's not even accurate. The sounds that the people are making the, 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 the whole setup. I mean, again, it's just entertainment and yes, you can learn things from it, but it is really entertainment, but there is other porn out there. So people just need to explore that. Like the, the person you mentioned, uh, how do you say their name again? Uh, Shine Louise Houston. Yes. Yes. Okay. So yeah, there, there's other ones out there that people just, uh, people who dislike porn, if they try those, they may totally change their opinion on porn and start to enjoy it. Yeah. It, and it's like, and if you don't, that's okay. But I think there's right. also the understanding that yes, can people misuse porn? Sure, mm -hmm. sure. Like I'm not right. at all going to sit here and act like it's not something that doesn't get misused, but right. it's a tool. It is a fantasy, like a mood setter. It yeah. can be, it can be a way to convey what you're into. I, as I moved towards realizing I was kinky and I had a, partner who was just so confused by all the things I was into it mm. helped to be able to show him some of this stuff sure. that I was into but via porn where I could say like this is hot to me and this is why this is hot to me and like maybe right. he didn't fully get it but I could show him like it's not violence it's it's you know right. the spanking and the thing there's like a you know it's doing something for me um right. But just even just conveying some of your things that you're into and, and it can be a vulnerable place to share. Sometimes I'm shy about watching porn with my, if it's porn that is very specifically, I'm something like that I'm very into. It's mm -hmm. a very vulnerable thing to yes. let a partner watch it with me. Cause I'm like, oh God, you're like looking at my brain right now. And I hate right. it. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's so personal. So very deeply very personal. personal. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But I think that's so true between, you know, uh, porn and erotica. It's a way to introduce your partner to something where it's not directly placed on either one of you. You're both looking at something external and then you can talk about it. It's not like you're looking at your partner and saying, hey, will you do this to me? It's, it's less direct, you know, it's indirect. Right, right. Yeah. And erotica is just porn that your brain fills in the blanks. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm always... <laughs> so I'm so confused when people are like against porn, but we'll read erotic kind of like, oh, I know, just right? Making a porn in your brain. Like, this is, <laughs> exactly. You're filming it with your brain and you're watching it. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. <laughs> it's so true. It is so true. And you know, it is so much more acceptable to read erotica or erotic romance than it is to watch porn, which is also very interesting. <laughs> right. Right. It's such a thing. And now there's like audio porn, which oh, is yeah. just somebody I, yeah. acting out. The, <laughs> yeah. they're, like, they're not reading a book, but they're like acting out a scene or doing one side of it. And, oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. that it lives on it's on Pornhub. Like they oh, have yeah. audio mm -hmm. porn on Pornhub. So it's yep. still porn. It's not classic porn, but it's still porn. And we just find ways. Right. We just want the sexiness conveyed for us and, and everybody seeks it out in a different way so there's there are unhealthy ways to experience things but I think not labeling all porn unhealthy is like a way to kind of step into it and realize that it can be a, a vital tool important part of your sex life absolutely absolutely so what kind of advice do you find yourself giving to people who are for the first time venturing into something kinky Ooh, my, so honestly, people hate it, but I'm like, listen, you got to get a couple books because mm -hmm. there's so mm -hmm. many, um, so many books on the market 
written by folks who've been doing this work for a long time, Mm -hmm. um, just to introduce you to things, you know, like Mm -hmm. there's the big book of bottoming and the big book of topping. And that's Janet Hardy, if I'm correct, but those are great books. If you are, if you're like, I think I'm submissive and I want to explore more, read about it, you know, before you go out and get into a community and you go in without any knowledge or knowing anything that one can be very dangerous as you know open and wonderful as these communities can be they're also filled with predators you know just like anywhere else right it's not safe just because it's an alternative community so kind of um I tell people to go in with knowledge and I'm not saying like the book is going to teach you everything but Mm -hmm. going in with some knowledge of what you're looking for so that you have a better idea, right? Of seeking it out, reading about it, seeing it in print and going, ooh, like, oh, I might, I might be into rope. That let me put that on my thing that I might want to explore that. Or ooh, I I really think I'm into like submission in this way and right. high protocol or or whatever it is, you know. So learning about things that way. Um, there's also like there's uh playing well with others by Melina Williams Haas and Lee Harrington. And it's a, it's not a thick book and it's literally a book of etiquette for kink and play parties oh, and things. So okay, it talks sure. about what to wear, like, you know, what to look for. And if you don't know dress code, here's kind of like the standard of what would be acceptable. Hygiene, um, flagging, what do these things mean? Uh, sure. Language. Mm-hmm. There's a glossary of terms, you know, it's just when you get it, when you're like totally like, I have no idea. I love stuff like that because it gives you a little peek at what's out there um, so that when you do go to do some in-person exploration, you don't feel completely lost. And I feel like it's a little harder for someone to kind of take you in who maybe doesn't have the best intentions you know right, like if you, right. if you're very like I know that's not what that is or I read yeah, about this right. yeah you won't be taken advantage of it, it, less likely you'll be taken advantage less of. likely right or yeah. at least you know maybe give you some knowledge to give you pause when certain things are brought up in certain ways right yeah. and I just think too it's also good to know about that kind of stuff to know that um everyone has rights and it doesn't mean that someone who is dominant to you takes away your rights. Right. Exactly. They don't take away your rights. They don't take away your body autonomy. They can't take away, you know, your right to, you know, consent and all those things and everything's Mm -hmm. a conversation. Um, I'm also a big fan of classes and Mm, Mm -hmm. there's a ton of different classes available in person online by different folks, um, going to a kink centered event is mm. great. Like a conference now, now that things are starting back up, but sure. I mm-hmm. one a big, a big help in my journey was going to some conferences where part of it is you're kind of walk. There's like a, a, usually like a room, like a dungeon and there's people set up who have their own, you know, if somebody's into needles, they'll bring their whole kit and they'll be looking for people to play with. Mm, so it's okay. kind of this area where you can walk around and like try things out. And okay. what makes it so good about it is because like the first time I did needles, I had like needle art in my back. Mm. The person had their kit out and I said like, I would love to try this. And they said, okay, let me get the DM, which is the dungeon monitor. And they okay. come over and I know nothing about needles, but that monitor knew what to look for. So they looked to make oh. sure they had all the safety equipment, all the high cleanliness, like that they could sterilize. They looked yeah, through their yeah. kit. They looked at the station. They talked to me mm. and made sure I had a conversation with that person. And so that person like sat me down and like explained to me what was going to happen and said like, have you, you know, have you done anything before? And I said, no, no, I haven't. So he's like, all right, we're going to start here. And he's like, is there anything you want me to know? And I'm like, I, pain makes me high. And literally it makes my pupils blow. Like I've done mm. drugs. So if mm. you, I need you to watch my eyes because once I hit that stage, I stop, it stops. I stop being able to tell you it's not good anymore because everything's going to feel good. Mm, sure. <laughs> <And so> even <laughs> I might be going beyond what my body actually can take, but I won't uh, sense it mm-hmm. because I'll be in another place. 
And that helped him because when that happened, he was like, okay, I see your eyes. We're going to like start pulling back. But it was a great first time. And I didn't have to wait until I was in a relationship with someone who does needles. Like I was able to explore um, with, with somebody. And I felt safe because I had somebody else who was knowledgeable come in to check and make sure everything was safe. So those kinds of environments are great. Um, I've gone to like one off events where it's same kind of idea where it's booths set up so you can go explore and see what people are doing. And mm. maybe it's somebody's doing rope and you can sign to sign up to be tied up. Um, okay, sure. Maybe they're doing something with like the, what is it called? The, I want, it's an electric wand and it has a name. Mm, it's electricity. Okay. It's a, eh, yeah. you know, I know what you you're know. talking about, but I can't think of the name either. I, I know you're talking about the name. Yeah. But those, that was how I got a taste of like, oh, I love this or, oh, nope, nope, this is not me. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you how know? do people find out about these? Like if someone that's curious about this, how would they even find out where and when they are? Yeah. So I, there's a site called FetLife. It can be a dumpster fire at times, but one of the things that I really appreciate about it is they have a very robust, um, events section because people can go and anybody can load up their event or the thing that they have coming up um okay so you, yeah you can go check by your if when you you can make an account you don't have to put pictures you can put very like rudimentary information and in just if you don't want people to come find you or whatever but you put mm-hmm. your zip code in and so it uh, loads everything that's it in your zip code within like miles a certain oh, number of miles so nice. within your state basically um, uh-huh. and when I'm traveling, I'll go on and I'll put the zip code in for where I'm going oh, Okay, and I yeah. can see what's happening in that place. So a lot of things get put there. Um, if you're on, I'm trying to think following, trying to find folks and, and I, I'm saying this and, and I know it's hard, but like go through, if you follow sexuality folks and you see anybody posting about kink, go see who else they follow. Um, go oh, look sure. at, mm-hmm. that's what I do. Like when I see them posting about some stuff, I'll go like, who else do you follow? Or if they if they talk about being an event at an event, I go and I like add them because it's not easy. This is not stuff that's like on a poster board somewhere, you know, like yeah. we, we, it's not out there, but there are ways, um, to get into things. Um, I'm trying to think of some other oh my goodness following anybody who writes the books like the kink books mm, uh, sure, sure like that makes sense janet hardy lee harrington melina williams haas looking at who they follow midori midori is a rope um to a shibari mas- master she doesn't like to be called let me call that she's a shibari expert um okay yep but so following finding those people who are writing your the books and mm-hmm. seeing who else they're in community with also when they're appearing in place at places, they will post about it. Mm, that, so that's how I've sure. learned about different things over the years is following them and going, oh, you're going to be at this thing. Let me see about being a part of this thing. Let me see about joining this um, event and buying a ticket for it. Uh, or you're going to be teaching here. So that's how you start too, is finding the people that are doing the thing from, on an expert level, level, seeing where they're teaching seeing where they're appearing, looking at who else they follow. Those are good ways to kind of start inching into finding some community within the thing that you're interested in. It can be difficult. And it, I know it sounds like a lot of work and it is. Um, and if you're in a place, go into a sex shop, like if your local sex shop. Oh, uh, we, sure, we get, yeah. Because we get flyers when when there's uh, play parties, as long as they're open to the public. We don't, we don't get them for the private things. And that's usually yeah. what people are looking for. And I'm like, that is a whole other level yeah. of getting into the community and becoming friends with people. There's a lot of right. yep. gatekeeping within that. But like when Dark Odyssey does their events, sometimes we get flyers for it. People will drop them off. Like they do a summer camp and they do like mm. a, a, I think it's called, is it Winter Fire? There's, they do like a hotel takeover in the wintertime. Um, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, but going into your local sex shop and seeing what's there, like maybe the local swingers club has put flyers, maybe, you know, those are places you're going to find the more taboo, uh, you know, event things, because if they want to let people know about it, they'll usually drop things off at the sex shop, asking people who work there, if they know of any groups of any, um, 
meetups. Meetup is a place to look also. Um, you can't post sexual things on meetup, but like if you're doing like a munch or um, like there's a polyamorous group I follow and mm, I haven't okay. been able to make any of their events yet, but I found them and then I found them on meetup. And so now I signed up. So I get the emails whenever they're doing an event. Um, okay. Yeah. Cause they do like drinks. They call it poly cocktails. They, they go for drinks. Oh. <laughs> and so yeah. like one of these days I'm going to be able to make it, but I just went and I looked up, you know, you look up keywords um, and see what you can find. So those are, that's another way. Discord is another place. I know a lot oh, of people use. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. So there's discord groups um, are a great way to like, go look and see what community is forming because what happens is even if people aren't in your area, they'll tell you about some of the bigger events that are in other places. Like a lot of sure. events happen. There's a lot of stuff that happens more in the Southeast. Um, mm, okay. And you know, there's Midwest <laughs> kink of mm-hmm. this. All there, I know there's a big kink event in Oregon. So finding, finding kind of going into these things and trying to find your niche um, and realizing sometimes you may still have to travel for some of these things. So finding something that is, going to be fitting for you um when you're you know first getting into it and it may be that you're doing a lot of reading and learning before you actually get to try something and that's okay yep yeah I would think that it just seems like it's something that would snowball like your first forays into it might be a little bit harder but the more you get into it the more people you know the more people you follow it's just going to become easier and easier to find what what it is that you're looking for or what fits you Yeah. And I know that's hard for people because sometimes Mm -hmm. people want to like get in and just know where to go. And it's like, eh, here's the thing. The communities aren't very trusting and with good, good reason. So good reason, you know, they don't let just anybody in. They won't, you, people won't just tell you where the party is, (laughs) you know, it's uh, you have (laughs) to kind of get in there. So it's, it's kind of, like you said, it's snowballs. It's, you know, following, looking, finding that moment that's like, Ooh, I could go to this thing. It's not too far from me. I can, it's a time. It's not going to be too intense. It's just hanging out with other people, maybe having a drink and who are like-minded so you can meet people. So, Cause when people get to know you, then they'll be like, Oh, so-and-so right. did you hear about this thing? Because you become a, a face that people realize like, Oh, you're, I'm curious. I want to, I'm learning. I want to know about right. things. Yeah. And that's what happened with me. Like I wasn't dirty Lola when I got into kink. I, you know, was <laughs> still in, you know, working my way through with my starting up my career and sure. exploring this stuff. And so I was just going to things and going to classes. And then I met a couple people who invited me to a party. You know, it, it's like I did this and then I did this and then I did this and then I did this. Right. And then you kind of get your, you find your, you find your people. Yeah. Well, it makes perfect sense. And yeah, once you're on, you know, your acquaintances, your even friends, it's, uh, it's a total different, uh, route I would imagine. And you're just, you're going to find yeah. what you need to find. Yeah, exactly. I love to talk to people who, who are into polyamory too. What brought you to that point where you decided that you wanted to explore that? I was polyamorous in high school and didn't have a label for it. So Uh, it was just me being slutty. I had a, I dated a, I had a girlfriend and a boyfriend at the same time. Uh, Growing up, I never, I was not the girl who doodled like her future husband's names in her notebooks. I didn't want to get married. (laughs) I knew Uh very steadfastly, I did not want to get married and I did not want to have kids. And I knew that very early. Um, And my fantasy was like, I want to live in a house with a man and a woman. And this is our, and this will just be our life. Like I want that kind of relationship. Uh And then you, you know, you sail through it and society makes you feel like a freak and bad. And I didn't know it was a thing. And so when I did fall in love, I was like, Oh, I was just being really slutty and, (laughs) and I hadn't, and like, I hadn't found true love yet. And so now that I found true love, I'm monogamous. Well, that didn't work. Um, right, I was okay. mm-hmm. monogamous for a little while and I was horrible at it. And, <laughs> and I had 
like a quarter life crisis where I realized like, listen, I'm not living my life the way I know I need to be living my life. And I ended up having an affair and, but that affair taught me like, oh, I don't, I'm not trying to leave my partner. Mm -hmm. I'm just not happy with, I'm not happy with our relationship. Like I, the, the style of it. And I remember telling him that I'm like, I don't want to leave you. I just want to add to it. Right. Sure. Yeah. And so that was a very foreign concept for him. And he was like, no. And I remember I found a article in the New York times about polyamory. And I remember being so excited because I'm like, it's real. I'm not crazy. This is a real thing. People do this. Mm -hmm. And he was still, he was like, no, I'm not interested. But slowly we moved into like, cause I'm queer. And even when I married him, he knew I was queer. So that, sure. you know, I was identified as bi back then. And, um, mm-hmm. he was like, well, maybe we can bring in another person out. Like, okay. And that was a, we dipped our toe into tr- like dating, but we we're both awkward with girls. So that didn't work, but it was fun. <laughs> and then we started uh-huh. going to swing clubs and then that was fun. And we were having adventures doing that. And then it morphed into, polyamory and I've always said like I'm polyamory as part of my sexual identity it's who I am it's who I've always been like it's how I love I don't I've never understood monogamy I tried really hard to and I just it doesn't work for me um and he was polyamorous by association like by circumstance Mm. sure so Mm -hmm. our our relationship ended with him going to be monogamous with his girlfriend and her leaving okay. her husband to be monogamous. Everybody's worst nightmare. But I'm like, no, they found. Yeah. I'd rather him know who he is, and he wasn't a polyamorous person. Right. Um, I and I am, and I need that. So, right. you know, so you it didn't was match. Like, right, we didn't match, and it was a journey over time. And it was one of those things, right? Like, I took my time getting into it. We were open, but not poly for the longest time. And then we were when we, once we were polyamorous. There was so many steps and things we went through and ups and downs and even to get to where I am today and mm-hmm. my understanding of myself and what I need, it took time, you know, and I, mm-hmm. I always try to impress that upon people. It's like, don't rush your journey. Right. You're not going to be this perfect polycule, your first foray out. And believe me, if you think you are. It, it's probably not going to be the best. Cause I remember thinking we were when we, had our first like group, like our polycule. And I remember thinking like, this is how we do it. This is, we're doing it right. And it was a hot mess and it (laughs) broke up in the most hot mess of ways. Uh, Um, Cause we weren't, you know, cause we didn't really know what we were doing. We weren't really doing it right. So yeah, it was, uh, it's, it's taken time and it's, I'm very happy with, with, the life I've crafted and like I have a partner who lives in California and he's married and they have a kid and like we've okay. been together for five years sure um they're celebrating their 15th and I'm going for that oh, okay to yeah. their big anniversary actually all their people so all our polycule will be there all their lovers girlfriends all the different people in their lives okay. will be there with their families I met their families recently <laughs> oh wow which was a thing like I, they came out to their parents two years ago and so I met mm. them this past thanksgiving um which was a whole thing and now i'm supposed to go to a wedding with him because his wife can't get out of work and they it's just easier because their kiddo's not invited so she's like i'll stay home like i have work stuff and we don't have to worry about getting child care so i'm going which is a whole thing because it right right it's not your usual like oh yeah like he talked to his mom about it and, and like then he talked to his grandma to me you know and then he talked to the <laughs> bride and, and everybody's fine you know his mom gets a little high strung about it because she's like what if people what are ah, oh my gosh and yeah. the bride was like I'm excited to meet her so I'm like okay this is gonna be there great go. mm-hmm. yeah so it takes it takes time and you know it's um also not everything is polyamory and that's fine Right. So some things are just open and it's okay. Like we don't all, it doesn't have to be polyamory. I feel like people feel like they have to call everything polyamory. And it's like, no, no, it's not all polyamory. And it's okay if you're just open. Right. And not a polyamorous person. Right. Right. Yeah. So explain the difference for people that don't understand the difference between being open and polyamorous. I think that's a good thing to talk about. Yeah. So 
ethical non-monogamy is the umbrella, right? And Mm -hmm. polyamory is a thing under that. So polyamory is that if you are practicing polyamory, you are seeking to find other loving connections. Doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be sex because there's plenty of ace people who are poly Mm -hmm. in, in, in open relationships, but it's you're seeking loving connections. Sex comes with that for some folks, but it's not the whole dependent point of it. Um, sure. But your goal is to make these connections and form relationships. Um, now, within that, like I'm a polyamorous person and I date. My dating is just dating. Like people think dating is polyamory. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Dating is the process to finding somebody. And you might right. date multiple people until you have committed my thing is I don't commit like I'm not that I don't commit but I don't commit in a monogamous way so like if we decide to date that doesn't mean that I'm not open to having other lovers or other people I'm adding to it but I do it with the intention of this person being a part of my life and being a part of my partner's lives um and that's the whole thing so openness there's like so many different things like some people are open and it depends on what their rules are like I have friends who when they travel, because they both travel extensively, they're mm. when they're not with each other and they're traveling, it, that's when they, you know, hook up, love, they have lovers that live far away and the things, but those people realize that like when they're home, there's a wall there. So they yeah, they don't have, sure. like how I have constant contact with my partner, even when we're thousands of miles away, these people are like, once I'm home, we're monogamous again. Mm. And so besides maybe making logistic plans of like, Hey, I'm coming to your town or whatever. Right. There's no, the relationship doesn't keep, there's a connection that doesn't keep flowing once you're it home. Does, it's not active. Um, right. And some people though, that might be different for them. They might only act on things sexually and emotionally, deeply emotionally when they're away from home, but they still will like check in and there's a friendship with those people. Mm-hmm. Um, it all depends. So that's some openness. There's monogamish So monogamish tends to be people who are open to flirting. Maybe occasionally they do like threesomes or foursomes or things like that. Um, It's still mostly centered around their one relationship and they're not looking to bring other people in, but they're open to doing flirty, fun, sexy things. Um, Sure. Swinging fits under the ethical non-monogamy umbrella because swinging is sex focused. And it's not to say people don't become friends, but they're not bringing other people into their relationship. They're bringing other people into their bedroom. But right. their relationship, yeah, yeah. Right. And their relationship stays monogamous. Their bedroom is the thing that is open, but their relationship is like a closed loop. Um, yeah, and they, sure. And there's friendship and things, and, and there can be a closeness because it's friendship, but they're not looking to have like a relationship with the people that they are interacting with sexually um nice. and and there's so many like i'm i consider myself solo poly uh, because i am my i consider myself to be my own primary partner because i i live alone i don't you know i speak to myself and it's like what are we doing self are we right. going on this trip <laughs> i don't have anybody else to like confer with um, right. for most of the choices and things that i'm making so i i look at it that way so yeah there's there's different areas of it and I think also a lot of people who are just dating think that that's non-monogamy and I'm like okay dating has always just been dating like dating Mm. was never courtship back in the day yes maybe but dating I grew up in the 80s and the 90s so dating was like you went out to dinner and drinks and maybe you had sex with people but you were just dating and if you decided to be exclusive it became right. monogamous because you've decided to be in a monogamous relationship with each other. But right, right. Dating was always just like the tryouts. It was the going out. Do I like you? Do I like you enough to have sex with you? Do I right. want to keep seeing you? Okay, where is this going? And then deciding. But people date and then are like, like I date and I'm polyamorous. So they're, I don't close that loop. I don't close that loop with other people. But I'm like, oh yeah, you become a part of my life but I'm still dating. And, and the dating doesn't make me polyamorous. It's the relationship that I'm forming with most mm. people that makes me polyamorous. Sure, yeah. That makes perfect sense. I think that's good to explain to people. Absolutely. Yes. Cause the people are like, 
oh, well, he's seeing multiple people. I'm like, yeah, but that's dating. And why would you commit to a person after one date? Like, right. why would you go like, oh, I'm not seeing other people. <laughs> I'm seeing this person. And I get being like, sometimes just for my brain's sake, I can't date multiple people, not because I don't want to, but I'm like my schedule and timing and trying to find. So I try to focus on a person I'm interested in when I'm trying to like figure out what I'm doing. So dating, and it's not that I'm being monogamous. It's that just in this moment, like I still have my partner. I still have my lover, mm-hmm. but th- for this person, I'm going to like pause on looking for other people just cause I can't, my capacity, my amount of spoons that I have to do the dating thing. Cause dating is hard. D- dating is mm-hmm. taxing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's, I think just people need to expand their vocabulary, but also understand like not everything polyamory has become a buzzword and so not yeah, everything is that yeah like you can just be open you can be non-monogamous you don't have to be polyamorous right and i yeah i've interviewed a few couples that are uh that are swingers and they're all different too and what that comes down to mm-hmm. is communication and agreed upon boundaries and what each person is willing to do what they want to do what they're comfortable doing and you know th- th- this one couple one man I interviewed, he and his wife will decide, you know, if if they want to proceed with someone, but if either of them fill off, they have a signal and they do that signal. And then they know that, okay, this, this, we're just having dinner with these people, but nothing is going to progress because one of them has an issue. Right. And that's communication. Even, even that, you know, it's just a simple way to say, you know, no. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yep. Even when they're out with the people. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, at the end of the day, it just comes down to communicating and like being open to things. And like I said, like my partner, my ex-husband was poly by association and it was because he was open to the idea of it. But the ultimate thing was that his heart didn't have the capacity. He literally like focused on this new person and then fell out of love with me. And it's like, yeah, Mm -hmm. I don't do that. I don't fall out of love I can it's sometimes the the hard thing is is I sometimes remain attached to people in a love way Mm -hmm. even when I don't want to you know like it's and I keep adding to it and um I have an abundance of space in my heart for people and um where it's like I get I don't understand the like okay well now I only like you and I can't like this person with this right and I'm like I don't, how did you do that? Like, I don't know. <laughs> how do you do that? I mean, I can focus on people and I tell that people like, so are you always thinking about everybody? I'm like, no, that would be rude. Like I'm not, <laughs> I'm, if I'm with you, I'm with you right, in that right. moment. Yeah. But even that, like my partner, we've been together for five years. So like when he visits, there's time he calls us, you know, I know he's going to call his wife. We all, it's kind of routine, like in the morning. He checks mm-hmm. in and, and I, and I like, I say hello, but I go away so that yeah. he can do a little, like, here's what's happening on my trip so they can have their moment. Um, I also talk to her a whole lot. So usually I'm texting her while <laughs> we're together. I'm like, sure. he's being annoying again. Um, <laughs> and, but it's also like, you know, talk to each other about the new people we're seeing or what we're excited about. And those are things, but that's because we have like a really solid foundation with each other. When yeah. I'm building that with new people, I try to like, I want to give you me so that you can get to know me. Mm-hmm. And then like, and I'm honest about who I am and, you know, I'm right up front about like, here's all the people I date and here's what my situation is. But when I'm with you, you're knowing me and I'm not bringing that in yet. And I've been in relationships where eventually I'm like, oh, here's my poly family. Like, would you want to be on a phone call, like a FaceTime while I'm with them? Cause you're here. Like I've had, I had a person I was dating and they happened to be at my house and we were doing our morning call. And I was like, I was going to say like, oh, let me just tell them I can't talk. And he's like, why? And I'm like, oh, do you, do you want to, I thought that might be awkward. He's like, no, we're having breakfast. And so that was the first time he met my poly family Uh, was that way. And it was very cute, but you know, it's, I think people worry. There's this thing of like, oh, you're not going to focus. You're going to be thinking about the people. Yeah. Like here's the thing monogamous people think about other people too (laughs) right (laughs) we all have our (laughs) fantasies and things but yes it's we I have the ability to have an abundance of 
love in my heart, but I also know how to compartmentalize when necessary. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really interesting to hear you talk. It's like people either are, they just are the way you are or they aren't. And, you know, obviously you're going to match up with other people that are like you and not right. with others. And it's, it's about knowing yourself and understanding yourself and accepting yourself and accepting that maybe the person you're with currently isn't like that. So you're not going to have your optimal unless you find people like you. Right. And that there's nothing, I, I think people get so caught up in that they have to be a person for someone. And I'm, yeah. and I, that for me, I'm like, this is why we have so many problems within relationships is because yes. we pretend to be these other people. Like we pretend to be the sex pot who loves blowjobs and who's really into baseball and who's this, right. this and that. And then when you get into the relationship and you realize like, okay, I'm in it. And your partner realizes like, you don't really enjoy giving me oral sex that enthusiastically. And you don't right. really like sports either. That ha- that feels like a betrayal. And that begins the downward slope of a lot of yes. relationships. And I feel like those are points where if you bond, so like I truly enjoyed baseball. It was one of the things that helped me bond with my ex-husband when we were getting into our relationship is finding the things that I actually liked right. and and seeking that with him and not pretending to be into things and the things that I wasn't into, I wasn't into, you know, I didn't, I, I was like very quickly like, ah, nah, dude, that's not my thing. But there were so many things that I really was into that he was into and that helped us bond. And I just tell people, I'm like, listen, it's okay to, I know with people, especially people who are looking for a husband or looking for a wife, you want to be this person, you want to get chosen, but be chosen by somebody who actually fits you and not by somebody you're pretending who fits who you're pretending to be. Right. I think you have to be true to yourself. And if you're not, yeah. you're setting yourself up for some sort of failure along the way. Yes. And it might happen after you have kids. It may happen when you've been married for years and you have kids that my DMs on Twitter tell me there's a lot of people who are in unhappy marriages because they just kept pretending and now they don't know how to get out of it and they are sad and depressed and cheating or fulfilling their fantasies in another way. And it's just going to yeah. end badly down the line. And, you know, it's sad. Like I feel bad for people who are in that situation because it's, they've, they spent so long pretending to be a certain person or into a certain way or okay with a certain thing or okay going without you know like oh I'm, I'm fine right. that we don't have sex all the time and then it's then they realize like oh I'm really not okay with this and I'm trapped now I'm or they trapped, feel trapped yeah. mm-hmm. or yep, it's good yep. and and the separation is going to be explosive yeah. because oh, it's yeah. been so long yeah so it's like at the beginning what, what if at the beginning we found other people whose libido wasn't as intense as, you know, if, if ours isn't intense, that's who we find. If, if we have a big libido, we try to find somebody who has a larger libido, but also understand that that can change. Yeah, I was just um, going to say, be yeah, honest yep, about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Because yeah, I've listened, my libido was off the charts and I've hit 40 and sometimes I'm ravenous. And sometimes I'm like, I don't want you to touch me. <laughs> <laughs> let's just right. cuddle and watch a movie um yeah. but finding that compatibility uh yeah yeah you know there's a educator I forget who it is that they do a a whole workshop and it's dating your own species uh-huh. and that means just like finding people that fit your like if you're a monogamous person who falls in love with a polyamorous person not saying monopoly can't work but right. are you expecting them to eventually be monogamous? That's not, right. that's not the thing. So maybe you need to go find another monogamous person. If you're a polyamorous person, I try, like, I look, if somebody's like, I'm really into you. And I'm like, oh, well, you say you're monogamous. And they're like, well, I can, I'm like, no, because I'm not going to change for you. Right. I'm telling right. you that now it's not happening. Right. Um, right. So like, let's not do this. And it's not to say people can't, overcome the obstacles but if your expectation is for somebody to come to your side you know that's a point to realize you're not really looking for somebody who you can make a make compromise with and figure things out you just want you're hoping that they'll become 
polyamorous or that they'll become monogamous or whatever it is, you know, that right. they'll suddenly really love low jobs all the time. <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, yeah. Be true to yourself. And if you're going to be just doing something to please someone else, you're not serving yourself at all. Not at all. You're setting yourself up for potentially a big giant blow up, like you said, a big, yeah. huge breakup someday that's just going to be just devastating. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's tough, tough, tough place to be. What, well, you know, this so has been so. an amazing talk. I'm just, I'm just loving talking to you. Is there anything else that you'd like to say or add that we haven't touched on yet? Oh my goodness. We talked about so much. Um, we did. It was, it was, epic. Yeah. <laughs> it was so wonderful. I mean, I guess I just leave with folks that all of this is a journey and it's an adventure. I look at it as an adventure and it's about where you can go and it doesn't have to be, nothing has to be static. You know, like a decade ago, I was monogamous and unhappy, I was a housewife, right. not and working a job I, I, I hated. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now I'm in a place where I love what I, what I do. I love the life that I've formed. I love all the people that are in my life. And that took time and it took me really learning what I wanted and, and being true to that, like realizing I was only hurting myself and others by not being true to what I wanted and needed. So right. just kind of keep that in mind. And, and I don't want anybody to walk away from this thinking that we hate monogamy. I, right. I know so many wonderful monogamous couples who are, you know, near and dear to me and I love their love. And right. I talk to them all the time about this, that like, I love that you figured out how to make this work for you. And that I, yeah. I don't, you know, the same way you're baffled by me, I'm baffled by you, but I, I love <laughs> your love and I love it. And I want, and I think all the things that we talk about when it comes to polyamory apply to monogamy, you mm -hmm. know, uh, communicating, um, being open to trying things, being there for your person, um, you know, being up for the adventure. There's plenty of adventurous things you can do as monogamous folks. So just remember, like, it's a journey, it's an adventure. And there's always room to grow and, and find new things. And, and yeah, I uh, hope you have a good time doing it. Oh, absolutely. And also that we need to be more open and not judgmental of people who are more different than us. I mean, I just don't like the people that are, uh, they're in a monogamous relationship and they just think everything else is wrong. Like, you know, right. bad, you know what I mean? Like right. the, just that judgment. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's not bad. And, and, and I get feeling judged when it feels like, uh, cause I know a lot of monogamous folks will feel like, Oh, I'm being judged or you're saying it's bad. And it's like, no, they're saying it didn't work for them. And right. I think that's the problem is, is that we were all sold the same bill of goods. We were all mm -hmm. told we have to, you find that person you love, you fall in love with your princess, your prince, your knight in shining armor and your life will be perfect. And the truth is, is that is not the truth and wasn't the truth for so many of us. And I think we're all, all of the folks who are in the ethical non-monogamy community umbrella area have just fought so hard to like find ourselves and to be accepted. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we talk about it a lot because it's still not, you know, I just wanted to be a, a choice. I want right. kids coming up to know, I don't want them to be like me. I don't want it to be that like, oh, I'm a bad person, right. a dirty person because I want this. So I must be waiting for the one thing that makes me be in love. And then, you know, part of this journey involved hurting somebody, you know, like in figuring mm -hmm. that out, like I can't, yeah. because I didn't know. And had I known about polyamory back then and that it was a viable choice and this was the life I could live, I probably right. never would have gotten married. <laughs> Right. because you know it wouldn't have been something he wanted you know so yeah, and I wouldn't right. have wanted to be monogamous so I revel in that kids can make choices now they right. can decide oh what is what where what where where in me does this lie am I capable of multiple people or am I monogamous let me figure it out you know like there's a whole let me figure it out and getting to a place of like maybe I'm not no or yes I am um but I want the choice you know I want I, I want people to feel like they have 
a choice and that it's an okay choice and it's not a bad or dirty thing. That's all, that's all we want. And so the more we talk about it, it makes space for the people who are our age, who didn't ever get choices to hear it and go, oh, I can do that. <laughs> right. Yeah. You yep. know, like that's what it took for me. It was this, I can do that moment of, and I remember that moment was where I, I finally felt whole again. Like, oh, this is, this is what I've been looking for again. Like, this is what I've been trying to get back to. Yeah. This is oh, me. Mm-hmm. This is me. It's who I am. Oh. Right. And so whatever that is, even if, in, even if it is monogamy, like if you are, that's you, but it's like, yes, you are, you should be allowed to find that and revel in it, whatever it is. Exactly. And that's amazing. And I, and I feel like, yeah, that's getting to more and more commonplace where people are accepting that. I mean, there's still a lot of people that don't, of course, but like you said, the more people talk, the more it can be, you know, more normalized and not seen as just evil sinful thing it's a choice and and it's who you are it's not I mean it is a choice but it still is who you are right exactly right it's it's part of my makeup (laughs) yeah exactly but it's it's who you are yeah exactly right yeah oh this has been amazing I have loved talking with you this has been an amazing chat thank you so much for chatting with me Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. And come back anytime we can chat again. <laughs> of great. course. Yeah. Well, and good luck when in, oh, in that conference you're going to in July, where's that one? Is that one in New York or are you going to That's else? in Burbank. It's a trade show. It's called, um, oh, okay. A&E and it's A-N-A-N-M-E. Um, and that's one of the bigger sex toy, like trade shows that happen, um, and it's open, it's open to people in the industry, but also now they have a sex educator track and they have a um, journal, journalism, journal, press. I'm like, what, what's the word? Oh, they have a press okay. track. So you can apply as a pre- person of press, which oh, what you okay. do, this counts as press um, and, uh, and sex educators. Cause basically it's, it's a moment for these companies to showcase the new things they have coming out oh, for you sure. to see, to see it in person up front. So it, as much as it is for uh, people who own stores to go look and see what they want to buy for their places of work, it's also a great place for people like me and, and bloggers and other people who do this work to like see stuff, to be able to talk about it and, and get it out in the world um, and know what's out there so we can make recommendations to folks. And, you know, because sure. part of what I do is also like consulting with folks and helping them find products that work for them. So. Okay. When yeah, I go yeah. and I, I basically go get to see this stuff up close, I can go, Oh, let me tell you about this thing I just saw. Yeah, you know, right. Yeah. Uh-huh. Very cool. Wow. That's awesome. And have fun. I'm sure Thank you will. Thank you. <laughs> I will. Yes. Well, you will be on amazing... my social media. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can see those pictures. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. And you have an amazing day. You too. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. I want to thank you for listening to this interview with Dirty Lola. I will put all of her links down in the podcast notes so that you can easily access her information and where she is online and to learn more about her. And I will also put my links down in the podcast notes so you can link through and find my books and my Patreon. If you would like to join and support my podcast and get exclusives, join my Patreon, which is in that Linktree link down in the notes, Linktree Ruin Willow. So I hope that you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. I really learned a lot from Lola. I have to say, it was very interesting for me. I'd always heard about polyamory, but I didn't know as much as I know now, thanks to her. So she's got great things to say, great advice, and just somebody I really enjoyed chatting with. And I'm really glad that I get to share her views and her knowledge with you. Thank you for listening. And I hope you have a fucking sexy day. Love ya.